doing things a little bit differently. We've sort of uh, juggled the the order of things a little bit. So uh, just just you'll need to put up with us. We've also got um, our IT guy Ashley is is remote today, so um, we've had to set up everything here. So hopefully we'll um, we'll run pretty smoothly. Okay, so what we are looking at tonight is um, our friends from the Melbourne Space Program will be presenting first up uh, and they will be um, presenting about their program, but in particular, ACRUX2. Um, we had these guys uh, present to us a couple of years back now. Um, they were talking at that time about ACRUX1, which was a satellite, a CubeSat that they got into orbit. And now they're working on the development of a, I think it's a 3U CubeSat. And uh, that's what they'll be mainly presenting tonight. Okay, um, at about eight o'clock, we'll have Angelo Di Grazia talking about his recent trip to the US to see the um, unfortunately scrubbed first two launch attempts of Artemis One mission. So um, we'll get a bit of a, um, an interesting um, story about his time in Florida at the Kennedy Space Center and then his uh, trek across the country to Houston in Texas and down to SpaceX Starbase at Boca Chica. So uh, you can see there the, the big ships in the background there. So that will be pretty interesting. <laughs> um, so Angelo will go for about 40 minutes or so. <laughs> we all know that he won't. Uh, and um, then our president, Peter Alward, who's not with us tonight, but he will be remoting in to uh, give some updates and news on the Space Association itself, and also um, some Australian and international space news headlines. So that will be, that will happen after Angelo. And if there's time, and I hope there will be time, um, after nine o'clock, we'll have Andrew Rennie, who's going to give a little preview of the DART mission, which uh, is expected to impact um, the asteroid. Uh, I think it's tomorrow morning, our time, is that right? So that's, that's the plan for, the, for tonight. So as usual, we've got lots of stuff. <laughs> so um, we, might, we might make a start. Uh, so we've got James and crew. Uh, James will introduce his colleagues from the Melbourne Space Program, um, and they'll give a presentation on uh, on the work that they're doing. And uh, yeah, we look, really look forward to it. Thanks very much. Okay. Anyway, um, hi everyone. My name is James Condos. I'm the co-lead of our ADCS subsystem, which is one of Can our you many tilt subsystems. Tilt the camera up a little bit, sorry, where like the top of your head's yeah. dropped off. There we go. And then um, with me, I have about a fraction of our team. So we have co-leads from our OPC team, which is our onboard computer. That's Dan right there. Then we have Nadun, which is a co-lead of our, our comms um, subsystem, so our communications. Then we have Sophia, which is the co-lead of our cam subsystem, which is basically the camera that's on top of the satellite. And then we have Kashav, which is also someone from the comms team. So yeah, hope it's a hope you guys have a great night and hopefully get something out of out of the slideshow and the presentation. So yeah, this is also Thomas. So he's part of our finance team. So obviously we need something to finance the satellite. And it's not as simple as just budgeting. Like obviously we have to make some plans and some trade studies to actually understand how much everything costs. So what is MSP? MSP is a student-led organization and we've been running for, since about 2018. Now, we are primarily, primarily focused in the space sector, but we also do have quite a few projects in the robotics industry and some bushfire mapping, like projects like bushfire mapping, uh, robotics, um, but mainly it's the space sector. For our team, at least it is the satellite. 
Um, we did launch a satellite in 2019. So we launched Aircrux One. That was a one U CubeSat. So it was about 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. Now that satellite didn't actually do much. All it did was go up into space and kind of pinpoint like where it was and it came back and said, okay, you're communicating with us. It didn't actually have a main purpose. It was a go the goal was just to get it up there. Now, as I said before, we've done work in robotics and we just started a new project, which is an animatronics project, which in essence, we are creating a robot dinosaur to entertain kids in hospitals. This is because they get quite distracted and it's not a really friendly space for them in hospitals. So that's the main goal of that project. And as I wanted to say, we are the future of Australia's space sector. Um, Australia has been investing in the space sector for quite some time now. And they've only just realized how important it really is. Um, and that's a passion that we all feel the same about. Um, so yeah. So what do students learn at MSP? There's hard skills and soft skills. There's a lot of technical skills that goes into this. There's decision-making and design skills that go into CAD, which is a, a software to model different 3D prints. Um, we also have PCB design, which is designing motherboards and um, that sort of thing. Um, we also have software skills, which is included in programming. So C, C++, Python, MATLAB, there's all different programming and Python um, languages. They're all programming languages that are used within the entire system. And then we have our kind of analysis of the entire system. So we have power analysis, mass analysis. We have to do a bunch of testing to understand how the satellite runs and if it's operable. Then there's also soft skills. A operation like this isn't actually effective unless you have the necessary soft skills to get it working. So you need to have great communication. Without communication, the entire thing is just not gonna work and we're never gonna get it up. So some of our ACROX1 graduates, which talked probably with you in 2019, have gone on to do some incredible things. They've gone on to go to Oxford. Some have gone to Melbourne Space Labs, which is also a um, lab at Melbourne, at Melbourne Uni. We have Cambridge PhD candidates, Gilmore Space, which is also a space company in Australia, and a defense graduate of the year. I didn't actually know that, but that's really interesting. And then at the bottom there, bottom right, we have a picture of ACOX1. So I'm not actually too sure what they're doing in that image, but that is the shape and how ACOX1 looked like. ACOX2 is basically three of these. So they're gonna be stacked on one on top of each other. And you can imagine it like a loaf of bread, right? So it's about this big, so 30 by 10 by 10 centimeters. Then what happened there? Anyway, this is a picture of um, Melbourne and that is the aim of ACOX2 basically. So I'll give you over to Tom and they can give a talk about it. All right. So as James pointed out, the aim of ACRUX2 is for us to uh, image and map parts on the, on the world. In particular, we're focused on Melbourne and to hopefully get a team photo, even if we're just small pixels, of us in Melbourne. So that's the aim of ACRUX2 and it's building on some of the uh, fundamentals from ACRUX1. Um, so, so ACRUX2's goals is we want to take a big picture of Melbourne so that we could see ourselves. And this was outlined in the Australian Space Agency's um, goals moving forward was that they wanted to get, one of the things was better imaging of the Earth's surface um, for stuff like bush for fire mapping and other tools, weather. The aim is to load a space grade camera onto, onto the bottom of the satellite and we're still in talks of developing whether we want to uh, get a company to partner with us with the camera or develop our own. So this is a pretty uh, big task for us over the next couple of years. Uh, we are a student led organization, so we have a high turnover rate. Um, a lot of us are studying, working with competing interests. So. Um, it's going to be a challenge, but we're looking forward to applying some of our knowledge and trying to get this satellite back up into space and take some photos. So James 
briefly mentioned what is our CubeSat. And our CubeSat is three times the size of the one of ACRUX1, which is down the bottom. It's the size of a loaf of bread. And the aim, it gets broken down into about six major components. Uh, we have a subsystem for each of our major functions, and I'm just going to run through them quickly. But we have CAM, which is the camera payload, the ADCS, which is altitude and determination and control subsystem, uh, the chassis or the structure around the satellite, the communications between the ground station, where we hopefully send commands and receive the image back to the ground station, the electrical power system, which keeps everything operating and running, and then our onboard computer for decision-making and our microprocessor. So hopefully that's the last of our acronyms tonight. Um, hopefully, it's a handful, I know, but we'll just go through. This is sort of in the bottom right. That's it. I'll now pass over to Sophia, who will talk about the CAM. Hey guys, um, I'm Sophia. I'm part of the camera payload team. Sorry, can you turn the camera down a little bit again? Okay. How's that, Ash? Yep, perfect. Thank you. Yep. Hey guys. Um, okay, Let's see if I can do this. Okay, so the main purpose of our satellite, like James and Thomas said, is Earth observation. So the first goal is to take a picture of um, Melbourne and hopefully us. And then further from that, um, as identified by the Australian Space Agency, um, Earth observation is quite important. It's an area of focus for them. And this is useful for lots of indus industry applications, research and disaster mitigation and more. So that's kind of what um, my team is focused on. Cool. So these are just a couple of pictures that I'll show you of what Earth observation kind of means. So this is a picture of vegetation in Melbourne. So obviously the green bits is where there's vegetation. Uh, we have bushfire detection. So the red parts are where bushfires are occurring. I think this was a couple of weeks ago. So that's quite important for Australia, especially to know like where bushfires are happening and it will help us with like disaster prevention, mitigation, all that kind of stuff. And then also water quality. Uh, so this is like, important for environmental and infrastructure policy makers. And obviously it tells us that we don't want to drink that water. Yeah, so our team is split into two streams of work. We've got hardware integration and data processing. So um, I'll start with hardware integration and, and then I will follow that on with data processing and what we'll do with the images that we capture. Cool. Yep, so the main goals of hardware is to be able to um, integrate with us the sensor that we're using and we're gonna try and command it to capture, send and save an image. Yep, so our current progress so far is that we've set up an isolated Raspberry Pi mini computer and also RGCAM camera module. And um, yeah, and try basically um, save an image as a data stream and ca yeah, capture it and send, save an image as a data stream and convert this data stream into a viewable image, which is what you see there and also get it ready for further data processing. Yeah, and then so next steps for FlatSat V1, which is our first kind of milestone or like PDR, is that we wanna set up a pipeline to send this image data to the processing scripts. Um, we wanna be able to integrate with the rest of the satellite. So the onboard computer and the communication subsystems, which they will talk about later. And also since lead times are about six months to one year for the commercial space grade cameras, we wanna be able to start designing um, our own kind of uh, spacified commercial off the shelf camera. So this includes things like tearing down the casing and, re and rebuilding an aluminum chassis, which is useful for, or which, which we need for radiation prevention, um, implement active and passive thermal control to keep the camera with an operating temperature in space. Um, ruggedize the chassis and also implement vibration, pressure, and thermal testing to ensure that it survives launch and space. Yep. And then, so the second stream of work is data processing. Um, so this, the main goal of this is to build algorithms to extract useful information from the data 
and the images we capture and optimize the data pipeline. Cool. So once we're able to capture an image, what happens if we get something like the left image and not the right image? Obviously, we don't want the left image. It's covered with clouds. You can't see anything except white spots. It's not really useful. So we don't want to send this to the ground and waste data space and like time and all that. So we want a method to be able to um, decide whether the images that we capture is useful and, we, and that we, we want to send to the ground. And so this, um, so just from looking at the picture, we can figure out which one we want by looking at the amount of cloud coverage and how do we decide if there's too many clouds, we kind of just count the white pixels. So that's our cloud detection algorithm. Yep. So this is just to ensure that the images we send to the ground are clear and that they're useful and not cloudy. And then we want to delete the images that are not useful and just to save data space. So to do this, we count the white pixels and make a decision on whether there's too many cloud or too many white pixels and then and then delete the ones where it's like above the threshold that we have decided on. Um, obviously, this doesn't really make sense for snow covered areas, but since the scope of our mission is Melbourne, it should be OK so far. And then for next steps, we've got a few um, goals we want to achieve. So the first one is bushfire image classification using deep learning. Uh, so we want to make an algorithm that knows whether the image that it captures shows a bushfire or not. So to do this, we need a data set of labeled images to tell the algorithm what is and isn't a bushfire. And to do this, we're going to use the Sentinel-2 uh, satellite images. So Sentinel-2 is just a satellite from this European Space Agency that has a public database of images that they capture. Um, also, we're, we're thinking of also flying an RGB camera, but obviously just having an RGB image isn't the most useful, as um, research groups have told us. But luckily, there has been a lot of development and research into um, convert or to, into extracting near infrared wavelengths from just the RGB wavelengths, which is um, really good because near infrared is really useful for um, industry applications like agriculture and answers questions like, oh, which patch of which patch of crops need more fertilizer today, which is pretty important for farmers and agricultural companies. Um, we also want to be able to show um, what happens to vegetation over a particular over time at a particular location. So this is a temporal kind of um, aspect. And also we want to be able to build, ma build maps from the RGB images, which is the spatial kind of part. And then because the way that we want to save, um, because the way that we save data is pretty is different to Sentinel-2, we also want to ensure that the algorithms that we use uh, can be applied to the images that we capture with our own sensor. And also um, we want to optimize these algorithms so that we can run some of them on board to save space and amount of data that communications need to send to the ground. So those are our overall kind of goals for FlatSat V1, our um, first milestone. And hopefully we can achieve these um, by the time that rolls around. And I think I'm going to hand it over to Nadun for communications. Thanks, guys. Yep. So my name is Nadun, and this is Keshav, and we're part of the communication subsystem. So the primary, so the objective for APRX one is to take a picture of Melbourne, which means our objective will be to bring that picture down down to ground successfully. Um, so our primary objective will be to frequently downlink one to two gigabytes of satellite imagery. And we also have a second objective to downlink uh, telemetry data containing information about satellite state of health. Um, we also want to occasionally uplink commands that will control the satellite's orientation and position in space. Um, in order to achieve these objectives, we'll be, um, we'll be trying to use, we'll be pursuing the use of the S-band for imaging data because it provides us with a high bandwidth and therefore high data rates. And we're also hoping to employ a UHF for telemetry data because it's, because it's more suitable for receiving um, and transmitting small amounts of data. Um, so for comms, we have three streams of development. One is for the satellite communication module where we will be building the um, hardware and software stack uh, for the satellite, um, for our communications module. Um, and yeah, that, that'll, that'll basically be uh, what we'll be uplinking and downlinking on the S-band and EHF frequencies from satellite. We also want to build up a ground station network back here on Earth um, that will support that uplink and downlinking. 
from satellite. And our third stream of work is um, licensing, which will use permissions and privileges in order to transmit in the S band and UHF bands. So for our UHF ground station development, we will be primarily reusing many of the components and hardware used during use for the ACROX-1 mission. Um, after undertaking a uh, preliminary link budget analysis, we estimate that we have approximately eight minutes uh, to downlink data from our satellite. Um, and this provides us with the capability to downlink approximately 0 0.6 megabytes of data, which is well beyond the requirements needed to downlink simple telemetry um, data about satellite state of health. But upon completing a similar link budget analysis for the S-band, we found out that even though we have um, approximately eight minutes of uh, contact time with the satellite, um, this won't be sufficient to downlink the one to two gigabytes of data required. Um, so essentially an insufficient time and infrequent passes is our, is our main problem uh, in transmitting in the S-band. Furthermore, the cost of purchasing our own um, S-band ground station setup can far exceed $90,000, which we don't have the funds or capacity for. Um, so in, in, instead of building our own S-band ground station, we'll be employing the use of AWS's S-band ground station service, which allows us to downlink more frequently, provided that they have ground stations throughout the planet. And it will also allow us to download at it at a more affordable cost. So you have your pricing information there. Um, in order to um, deploy the uh, AWS S-Band ground station service, we have to um, kind of create a, a, opera, a structure. Um, and this is, this is an example of, of the flowchart that, that can be used to downlink satellite data. And now I'll now pass it to catch up to talk about our satellite module development. Yeah, um, thanks, Nadine. Uh, so along with the ground station, uh, we are also undergoing like a capacity building process for the satellite transceiver. Um, so our aim is to send and receive in UHF in addition to transmitting in S-band. Um, in order to achieve that, our two main areas of focus are the PCB development and um, embedded firmware development. Um, Developing custom PCBs for RF is not a simple task and our team's prior experience was relatively limited. So a recent sprint task that we completed was um, building three filters on Altium, so low pass, high pass and band pass filter. Um, we're currently waiting on those to arrive, but these images show the final product of our work. Um, so while simpler than our final system, um, the skills learned through this process will provide a strong foundation uh, for the future for future development. Um, in order to prepare, prepare for FlatSat and then future engineering models, we are working towards understanding the underlying logic and um, structure of the code and firmware. Uh, we are currently we currently do not have any engineering models of our transceiver. Um, so in order to do this, we have used these development boards, um, which uh, which have really like really good support and documentation, uh, allowing us as a team to better develop uh, um, our code base. The next steps for our satellite module is to develop it into a more sophisticated system using all of our work so far and our gained knowledge. This includes using an open source uh, project called OpenLST to say, to, to, sorry, to base our design on and then integrating it with uh, a space grade antenna and S band and an S band transmitter. Finally, we will integrate this system into ACRUX2 engineering and flight models to deliver on our requirements. These steps are, the major, are major milestones for our subsystem. We're excited to reach um, these, those points in our development. Uh, with that, I'll pass it on to Daniel for onboard computer. Hello everyone, my name is Daniel. Um, I'm the lead software engineer for our onboard computer. Um, we've recently expanded to a pretty large team as um, it's a relatively complex software project. Um, the primary responsibilities of an onboard computer are uh, coordination of all of the different subsystems that you've heard talk so far, scheduling of work, telemetry, which is the recording uh, and transmission of the work that's being done on the satellite, failure detection, isolation and recovery or FCIR. Um, the above sort of manifest into a concept of operations for the satellite. It's different modes and um, the different things it needs to be able to do. And uh, the team sort of was and still is pretty new to the world of embedded systems. Many of us come from 
uh, a web development uh, background or other areas of software engineering? So the first phase that the team went through was discovery, uh, learning more about exactly what we had to do with the system. Um, so we needed to research and select uh, a hardware and software stack, architect software that fulfilled all, the, all of the requirements, um, and then also research and plan for our failure detection, isolation and recovery. So what we've essentially um, mapped out is that we're going to perform failure mode analysis and fault tree analysis of the system with the other engineering teams. And um, they are essentially both an analyzing all of the failures from a top down or looking at the symptoms and, and then also looking at all of the failures from uh, a root cause and tracking how they would propagate. And then we're going to um, think about how we can intercept those failures or resolve them at a software level bef before deferring control to ground um, in order to resolve uh, with some human intervention. So um, the stack that we've landed on is um, some ARM core microprocessor hardware, which is a pretty common um, sort of a hardware choice in um, embedded systems. And we are choosing to use a real-time operating system, um, which allows us to respond uh, to things and control the flow of uh, our system more easily um, at the operating system layer. Then uh, above that, there's a, an abstraction layer before uh, we start to talk to NASA's F prime, which is an open source flight software that uh, or framework for writing flight software that NASA has made public in the last few years. Um, and then within that framework, we're going to be writing our own uh, application or business logic. So um, the, what's been done by the team so far is that uh, we've done a whole bunch of developer experience work to make it easier to write the code for the satellite, um, as well as sort of start to set up uh, all of our integrations with our hardware. And um, the we also, as I mentioned before, plan um, a bunch of our risk minimization strategies. So how we're going to use uh, both in software testing and um, testing that's integrated with hardware to um, validate and sort of do our best job of ensuring that the system holds together in orbit. And that if things uh, go wrong, we can still recover it. Um, one thing that we're really excited about is uh, bringing some practices from modern web development uh, in the form of continuous uh, deployment, uh, integration and deployment into this system, embedded systems project. So one thing that they do often in modern web development is as little pieces of code are added to a code base or to a complex system, they're continuously um, tested and validated and, and, and integrations are made with the full product more frequently, which means that you catch things going wrong earlier um, and can resolve them before they have larger or before they get heavily integrated into the system and become difficult to resolve. So the architecture of our software, I'm going to go through this too quickly because I don't want to make it too technical. But basically, we've chosen to um, have a central node at the top that controls the, mo the second to second process tick of our um, system and information propagates down by um, a sort of software or a tree structure, or you can imagine like a bunch of different arms, like, a, like an octopus into all of the different subsystems. And that way um, data will either flow up or down those arms and we can control the responses of the system uh, easily by either retrying things back downstream or passing control up uh, if there's a failure or something to upstream. Um, then, the FDIR layers are cool because once we've done the, that analysis that I mentioned uh, earlier on, we'll be able to write small little pieces of code that know how to handle very specific things at each layer of the architecture, which means that as we start to get a better understanding of how the integration of our system could go wrong, um, we can write really, really neat code to uh, address specific areas of concern. So the upcoming work for the team uh, is to train the, the large group that we've recently onboarded, um, implement proof of concept uh, slice or the, the, the uh, smallest possible section of the architecture that we can build to see it all running. Um, then begin integration with our camera and our communication subsystems, um, implement proof of concept testing, that, that automated um, work that I was talking about earlier as code gets added to the code base and seeing it run on uh, hardware is something I'm really keen on doing. 
and um, then fully automate that automated testing with our repository and um, modern uh, practices of managing a large code base. And finally, uh, start the FMA and FTA, all those, those failure analyses um, to start thinking about how we want to implement our error handling. And with that, I'm going to pass on to Rohit with uh, Systems Engineering. You'll have to remove the camera again. So, is that good enough? Uh, can you just move it a bit off the projector, so to the right a little bit? One more. Yep, that should be fine. Um, yeah, so I'm leading systems engineering with Shazen, my other team member. So what systems engineering and how it will affect the space mission development? Uh, so systems engineering is, a, is essentially an um, interdisciplinary course or a field of engineering which helps both project management and technical sides of a project to integrate together to get a good uh, output or the required output that each one are assuming for. So what is a system? Uh, essentially a system is a combination of elements that functions together to produce a capability that meets a need. That is defined by NASA, uh, which actually have their own systems engineering handbook, uh, but ISO, which is a standard for uh, which is a standard organization which has their own standard for systems engineering uh, for with the code of 15288. So they have their own definition for systems, but essentially they both uh, interchange together and you can use uh, any definition that you want. So where do systems engineering come into play? So, uh, so if you break down project management into three components, one managing technical aspects, to managing the project team itself, three, managing the cost and schedule of the project. So if we break those three as a part, uh, technical aspects is where systems engineering shine uh, bright, I'd say. So what are the uh, systems engineering and project management work together on will be the risks, stakeholder, stakeholder management, which is an essential part of big space project if you are working on, uh, data management configurations and other parts of schedules as well. So very famous V diagram. So an overview for system engineering process. It's, it, it is essential in life cycle process. First, we'll follow the uh, requirements engineering process, uh, which is uh, if you have a need, how can we change into a, a requirement which is unique to that need itself? It should not be uh, a need a requirement should not be two or three needs, should not answer two or three needs. A requirement is a unique statement that answer one need. A need is can be anything that your uh, subsystem or any, a, anything that your payload wants. Let's say now the current need for us is to take a picture for uh, Melbourne. So that is a need and we'll change that into a proper set of requirements. So. Current, that is where the requirement engineering comes into play. The ISO has uh, their own standards. Uh, sorry, that went wrong. It's to, it's not the correct standard. So 29148 is the standard. Uh, so that will define the technical requirements of that. And the next process would be doing the development, all of those. And then verification and validation is where systems engineering again comes into play. Then whole integration part will always be a part of verification, but yeah. So a space mission development, NASA, NASA has its own phases, which every major space agency follows. I'd say uh, European Space Agency has their own phases, which is instead of phase zero, it, it'll be a pre-phase A or something, but it will follow the same set of life cycle processes. So if you see this, there are seven phases, right? So seven phases uh, from phase zero to phase D. So all of the, those are mission analysis, uh, getting your requirements, feasibility, are they going to be a feasible requirements? Can we achieve those within the given timeline? 
Uh, then after going through the preliminary definitions, detailed definitions, all of where, until where the integration and test happens. So as you saw the other teams talking about uh, how they are working on, what are they developing? Uh, you can see that each team has their own way of on progress bar, which are developing in their own way. If this, if we follow the NASA process, we, we cannot actually perform integration and test until phase D, which is way after, uh, after your whole requirements are defined and everything, which at the current modern development or modern environment where students are working on CubeSats, that is not a feasible way to develop your satellite. Your requirements will change as you progress. So the answer to that is that we found that agile systems engineering, which is very well adapted in software field and relatively new to hardware field, uh, will provide a good solution for this where you can actually develop parallelly all of your subsystems and integrate where necessary and verify your requirements when necessary. So that is where this is, uh, uh, it's modern V life cycle. What it's happening is that, so these uh, over the left side, you can see the decomposition and definition, which is a traditional V life cycle, but in the middle, the V actually defines the test and integration. So uh, if you define, let's say a subsystem defines a requirement and we want to verify that before moving forward, we can verify that during, uh, during the development itself. We don't have to wait till until we all the integration and all the development and all, finalizing all the hardware requirements. We, we don't need to wait that wait until that we can verify, test, and integrate alongside while the development has been going on. So currently we are also following the uh, reviews uh, which are defined by NASA. Uh, these actually follow the phases as well, but we can interchange those requirements, sorry, reviews as we want. So what are reviews? Reviews are essentially milestones where uh, if you progress this this far, can you check those? And can you just tick those uh, requirements? Yeah, are they good? Yes. So that, essentially those are reviews. So what we do is that since we adapted agile systems engineering, so we laid down our reviews based on time, schedule, and cost of our project itself. So, uh, so we planned our reviews with other teams inputs where they are designing and developing and with the project management team itself to actually lay reviews at a particular point of time where the, the targets can be achievable, achievable by the subsystems. And as a systems engineering perspective and a project management perspective, we can verify those within a given time. So our goal for our systems, uh, for our systems engineering team, our goal is to, currently our goal is to do systems requirement reviews, which is a part of phase A, where you can see phase B, finished phase A and phase B, and PDR, which is a preliminary design review, or in terms of the subsystems level, flat chat V1 that they are talking about, and critical design review, which is we as a systems and project management team is working towards, even before the other teams are thinking about the further goals in terms of achieving. So. What is a PDR? So, uh, it's, PDR is one of a milestone. What we want to achieve by PDR, which we set for FlatSat one, is to verify the preliminary designs that each subsystem is designed or each subsystem want to design. And we want to see whether the, the designs are feasible and whether the uh, designs are cost effective and can be achievable or not. And after Verifying those, we'll release engineering plans, working to work, working along with the teams, and we want to release release of work breakdown structure is is not a mandatory because each team has their own time and they want to work when they have to. So if it's necessary, we can work with the teams and implement work breakdown structure. And we also want to standardize major requirements. What that's supposed to mean is that uh, uh, so we want to use eight by eight. Uh, size of a uh, CubeSat, Let, let's suppose. So uh, the CubeSat should fit all our components, right? So that is a standard requirement that we want to achieve, that we want to set before other teams proceed to development or integrate the systems. Uh, that is a standard, also verification plans, which we already established as the systems are standardized, uh, as the requirements are standardized. 
so the cdr which currently one of our major milestone for for now it's a major milestone for project management and systems engineering team so that is to achieve that achieves all the design uh, all the designs of the uh, all subsystems standardize all the designs finalize what components that you require either it's hardware or software for the flight model so uh, before doing it, testing the final testing that we have to finalize all of this and verification plans if there are any major verification plans uh, which cam has to cam our cam subsystem has to follow or uh, any of our obc or comms has to follow we have to have a particular uh, document for the verification and for integration processes and also assess if that is a feasible solution or what are the risks associated with that uh, integration part uh, so that is also the external interfaces if there are any required so currently comms require uh, interface from aws which uh, are there any risks associated with that in terms of cost schedule development uh, is there something that we have to assess before or uh, those kinds of uh, uh, verification process has to be finalized during the cdr time so yeah thank you so much for your time and, uh, Okay, thank you very much. That was fantastic. Okay, we've got um, we've got some time for questions. So um, I have one. <laughs> uh, if you have questions, I need you to come up and talk into the microphone. That would be really helpful. Thanks. Uh, and if you if you're answering a question, I need you to come and talk into the microphone too. Um, my question is: um, When were you hoping to possibly launch? A crux two, and I was also interested in, uh, like, uh, this was really interesting. You know, sort of a deep dive into each of the different components, uh, into the each of the different teams. But I'm interested in knowing about how how the project is managed, kind of across those streams, and how your governance is kind of set up and that kind of thing. So, some reflections on that would be interesting. Thanks. Sure. So we're aiming for a mid-2024 launch. Um, that isn't set in stone. Um, it kind of depends on where the development goes and if we're on track or if we're not on track. Um, obviously, for ICROX1, we launched through New Zealand. Um, we're not too sure at this stage. That's for management, management to decide. Um, but for now, the technical development is going pretty well. Um, so for how each subsystem kind of communicates with one another and how we get the engineering plans kind of going. We do have to occasionally set up meetings with each subsystem. So like, for example, OBC would talk with ADCS or um, Chassis will talk with ADCS or something. This is so we can kind of keep like touch basis with everyone to make sure that all the development plans are going well and that people aren't going to ahead or this is more of like a systems engineering like problem because like systems engineering kind of dictates how each subsystem talks with one another and kind of tries to make all the plans succinct and consistent. Um, Rohit can talk a bit more about it if you'd like to. Um, yeah. Sorry. Uh, in terms of how we manage uh, the each uh, development is that we plan our schedule or our or have this based on how the teams are moving forward. So uh, it's, it's essentially a meetings having having communication with each team and uh, what they are having in terms of uh, what they want to achieve and is there any external factors that associated with it. Uh, so th I would say. The major factor would be the interfaces. So let's say if comms now comms are developing um, AWS ground station. So if if data handling or ADCS has want to talk to the satellite to detumbling or something uh, in terms of orienting the satellite, the the way that they do is that uh, we as a systems engineer evaluate the risks associated with 
both comms development and the schedule and the goals. Uh, the same goes for ADCS. We will evaluate those and we will plan a particular schedule in terms of how uh, the effective development will yield the result, a good result. So uh, mostly it will be uh, based on project management team and team lead uh, or project lead. Uh, and we and project lead will plan the schedule for that. And if the target can or the goals can be achieved achievable in terms of our schedule, then uh, we will plan it accordingly. But uh, most of the development is uh, is open for each subsystem in terms of how the each subsystem has defined what they are working on uh, is based on their uh, own development and how they are, how they want to do it. So, yeah. Daniel uh, wants to explain. Yeah. So uh, during COVID, there was like a long period of R and D where we looked into what went into NASA's sets and things like that. Um, and the best way of envisioning how the project is currently run is mostly as separate R&D projects because of how difficult it is to transfer knowledge between students as they age out. So we're essentially building each module as a student R&D project with the systems engineering team, linking them together. And when we get to the point where we're able to integrate, we are hoping to leverage those practices that I was talking about before of small integrations often to reduce the risk of critical failures at, into, at the integration stage. Um, but we're not really at that point yet. Every team is still sort of finding their feet. Any other uh, I, I've got a question if that's okay. I, I'm Peter, I'm, I'm up here in Newcastle tonight. Great, thanks for coming along, gents. I've got a question, you guys, or oh, the Melbourne Space Program uh, built and launched uh, ACRUX-1 a couple of years ago now. What, um, what legacy like learnings and uh, who is involved with that project that are now involved in this, or is it a completely new team? And how are you making, well, how are you trying to make use of the benefit of that experience into what you're doing going forward? Thanks. Yes, yeah, so, um, the good question. There is There are almost no members of um, the original team currently still working at MSP. Um, but there is huge benefit both uh, in the industry connections that we have as a result of that team. Many of them come and work as mentors for us now. Um, and uh, we also have better access to the other experienced engineers within the teams that they are now part of. So as you saw, there's a bunch of them working in some of the budding space companies around Australia. Um, we're able to get in and talk to those companies. Um, and it also provides a little bit of legitimacy, legitimacy for us with the university in terms of accessing funding and things like that. Okay, I've got a question. Um, yeah, Julian here, I'm online. I'm in Perth, WA. Um, can't you use existing ground stations rather than develop your own ground stations, assuming that you're using S-band and, uh, and UHF. I think that's a question for Nadun. So we're currently not aware of many S-band ground stations that we can, we'll be able to utilize um, other than what AWS currently offers. Um, in terms of for the UHF band, we, have, we are aware that Sadnox um, offers a, a UHF service where we can um, download small tonnage packets to them and we can yeah, we can kind of link up with them and um, yeah, bring that data down. But so the thing with AWS, it also offers us a, a pipeline to get the data across down to us easily. Um, whereas if we were to interface with with other like with, with different organizations that may have their own S band ground station, we don't get that same accessibility to our data. So it's not as easy to interface with, I guess, other organizations and other providers of um, S band ground stations. <coughs> Okay, because I know you've got people like uh, Leo Labs and uh, ESA is, is a big one. Um, they're building another dish in WA. Um, and I thought maybe uh, Honeysuckle Creek you might be able to use for a fee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's definitely something we can... Uh, Honeysuckle Creek is no longer operational. I think you might be thinking of Tim and Billa, Julian. Uh, okay, yeah. All right. Honeysuckle yeah, Creek one. is a park with some plaques in it. Yeah. yeah, that's right, the other one. 
Yeah. Okay, all right. right. Cheers. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? I've got Andrew coming up in the room. And if there are other people online that would like to ask a question, please feel free to do so. Uh, your stated aim is to get a picture of Melbourne. Are you wanting to get pictures elsewhere in Australia and around the world? And at what altitude do you plan to fly uh, in, in the orbit? And what range of altitudes are acceptable given that you'll be on a ride share and you may not have a complete say on where you're going to go and obviously an inclination orbit of at least 38 degrees to get melbourne and uh, again what range of inclination orbits are acceptable so as for our goals and um where um like what kind of pictures we actually want to take as of now our main goal is melbourne and we might extend that de depending on where our development takes us um i was asking our legal team about, about this but i'm not actually too sure what the laws are about taking pictures of different countries from earth um because like i actually don't have no idea um so that's not something we've actually thought about yet but it's definitely an avenue that we'll go down and take a look at um as for the orbit i'm not actually too sure the specific numbers but i do know it's in low earth orbit i'm not sure if any of you guys know the specific numbers So ACROX-1 used an orbit of orbital altitude of 550 kilometers at an inclination angle of 92 degrees. Um, that's, that's similar to the orbit that we'll be pursuing. Um, in terms of inclination angle, we don't know yet because that's, um, as, as far as I'm aware, that's uh, specified by launch pride and what, what primary satellite payload the launch pride is carrying at that time, um, which, yeah, we won't be the primary satellite on that, on that launch, so. Yeah, um, James, what I was hoping you could talk about was um, the attitude determination and control systems, which uh, ACROX-1 <coughs> didn't have, um, but his team is, is working on um, magnet talkers and reaction wheels in order to more precisely uh, aim the camera payload. And so it should be feasible for us to take a photo of anything um, within range of our, of our orbit. Um, and we'll probably, we've started talks with the Australian government and stuff because uh, Earth Observation is a big priority of, of theirs about like what we may sort of generate use um, photographing. And I think we'll probably end up leaning on what the university wants to research a lot if we do end up getting something that's pretty reusable up there, so. I've got one uh, additional question here. Um, what what's the status of ACRUX one now? I suspect it's it's not functional. Is it still in orbit? Is it being deorbited? Is it uh, space junk? It um it, so it actually just burnt up the other week. Oh, oh no, really? Sorry, maybe a few months ago. Um, oh, okay. But they were getting intermittent pings from it for for years after launch, which is cool. Um, although that was kind of the uh, extent of the communication that they were aiming for. Obviously, we're hoping to downlink photos and stuff like that. So. Uh, we're definitely leaning on a lot of their pre-existing expertise in, in order to do that, but uh, it should be cool. I think they had a little party when it burnt up. <laughs> so this is a, a slightly more flippant question, but related to the camera and the images that you receive, I was wondering um, if you uh, actually photograph a UFO, will the filters to get rid of the aberrant photos actually reject that one? <laughs> I'm not sure. Oh, we've, lost our, we've lost our camera member, but uh, <laughs> I imagine uh, depending on how large the UFO is, the, the, the may, not, may or may not get registered as a cloud. <laughs> All right. Please, Mike, I have a question, if I may. Okay. Mike. Go ahead, Charlie. Hey, Mike, uh, thank you for the presentation, people. But um, I seem to recall quite a, an old project 
and uh, it's been around for a while, the Landsat imagery system, okay? About 20 years ago or so, it uh, actually took a single pass image of a bend in the Michigan River, for, you know, city of Detroit, and for one bit of data that it produced on that one pass, it could produce information about the environment, the water content, the pollution aspects, and probably also some of the uh, yeah the other natural features. So, how does your project fit in with the the bigger scope of Landsat, please? So we should also be able to uh, do similar analyses on all of the um, the data that gets produced. So. They what they likely did was they isolated a particular wavelength of the data that they got back in order to do analysis on, um, you know, whichever sort of particular feature of the image they wanted to do. Um, so you saw in one of the slides they mentioned multispectral or hyperspectral. So hyperspectral is a little bit out of reach for us, although we sort of tried to talk to some people. Um, but if we get really really broad data sets with uh, a, a large um, amount of, of different wavelengths, and then we can do we will be able to do similar analyses to, to that project. Um, what's also really exciting is once we get it back down to earth with all the, the cool things happening in machine learning and AI, there's um, lots of really cool potential with the data that we get. Okay, please. And what about the idea of uh, sequential images, say from one season to the next to the next and build up uh, you know, sort of an ongoing time perspective of say the location of Melbourne itself, please. Yeah, I think things like that should be possible and, and, and um, the use cases for the, the tool will be defined likely by what research the university wants to do and um, what we aim to do with future projects at Melbourne Space Program. Thank you. Thank you. How's that? Yeah, we're still fine. <coughs> All right, do your intro. Okay. All right, just bear with me. I'll just uh, turn this thing on. So, oh, here we go. Okay. Uh, welcome. As you know, the uh, my mission last month was to go and watch Artemis One launch. I can uh, concede that it was a total failure. <laughs> <laughs> because it didn't launch but i but i had a i had a good time and i got a lot of pictures so hopefully i'll go through those so i went there to see artemis one launching to the moon uh there it is before the launch attempts and i went there to watch it i had a schedule and everything it was uh really well thought out i'd fly from melbourne uh through to sydney through to Los Angeles, through to Orlando, Florida. Coming back, uh, I decided I'd go Florida to Houston. Then from Houston, I was going to drive down to Boca Chica, space Starbase. And then we flew to San Francisco and back to Melbourne. Started on the 23rd and came back to Melbourne on the 15th of this month. So Monday, the 22nd. Uh, as I reported last time, uh, 18 hours before I got on a plane, I got my visa uh, and my passport back. That's what you call cutting it fine. I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't had that visa, I've got to tell you. I wouldn't have been able to board a plane. <coughs> on the Tuesday morning, uh, because the flight was flying out at six, I stayed in a motel not far from the airport. So I was able to uh, get a... Uh, a quick start that morning. Uh, Virgin Airlines uh, flew to Sydney, did all the uh, custom stuff in Sydney, and this is uh, on the way to Los Angeles flying United. And I must confess, they, they were terrific. It was really good to fly with them. Uh, we were able to have internet on the plane. It didn't cost much, $25. $22 or something, and you'd had internet for the whole flight. Brilliant. Arrive in Los Angeles. And from Los Angeles, we flew to Orlando, and I stayed in a little place uh, 
down the base of Merritt Island. Um, a little townhouse there. It was absolutely superb. It was an Airbnb thing. Fantastic kitchen, all to my own. I arrived there late, about seven o'clock at night. The next day uh, was the first day of the, of the mission. That's where I was staying at Merritt Island, down the base there. And the first task was to go to Kennedy Space Center badging office to get my badge. And then I would go to the Kennedy Space Center press accreditation office. Um, what that is, is that because I was an international, uh, we had to be controlled. <laughs> so we'd go to this place uh, every, every morning and a bus would take us into the Kennedy Space Center and we were restricted within the media compound at Kennedy. Um, that day, I then went on to see the Blue Origin factory, <coughs> saw the one web factory, and of course, went past the visitor center. So those that know Kennedy Space Center, uh, the badging office is right next to the visitor center. Uh, Kennedy accreditation, press accreditation is down south and it is outside of Kennedy Space Center, uh, but you drive up the, uh, the road to, towards Blue Origin and you come to the south entry at uh, Kennedy. Um, you'll see Roberts Road there. And I also drove past Blue Origin, of course, on one web and Kennedy Space Center. Uh, that was often breakfast. And they taste the same as they do here. And they're about the same size too. Uh, I drove past the Kennedy, uh, or sorry, NASA Visitor Center and I could see the Atlantis building. Inside that building is the space shuttle. This is the badging office. So I drive in there early morning, just outside, there's a beautiful uh, rocket, well-maintained, well-kept, sitting there to remind you of the early days. And that was my badge that I received. Then I drove down to the accreditation office and I received my pass. Without those two, you're not going anywhere. Then, <coughs> Contingency pictures down to Blue Origin. Blue Origin is uh, quite an expansive uh, piece of real estate. Uh, this is on the south side. Uh, already, if you have a look at pictures, you'll see where that crane is. There's probably about four trusses that have been put up in the roof. That's an extension of their warehousing facility. Uh, and you look down the road and you see the main building uh, for Blue Origin. There's a couple of buildings to the left. Uh, they're all test stands and structures that are going on there. Uh, what surprised me about this place was there's a lot of cars there. There's a lot of action. There's a lot of things happening in there. It's just, just nothing seems to come out of the door. But, but I know there's, I know there's people in there. <laughs> um, again, looking as you're driving down a road, you're looking towards that south end. Uh, plenty of wildlife. You see it everywhere there not talking about the locals. Uh, there's the main Blue Origin factory. That's what it looks like when you're looking to the west. And there's the Blue Origin entry. Uh, just up the road, you come to Exploration Park and you'll see another building called OneWeb Satellites. That's where they make them. And just down the road further, there is the space, NASA Space Life Sciences buildings. So there's a couple of buildings in that Exploration Park that they've created. As you drive further north, around the bend, more Blue Origin. Then you drive past the Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex. So, you know, it's not to be missed, of course, because there's some really nice stuff in there and I'll show you that later. Um, up the road, Kennedy Space Center, this is the road that heads towards Titusville and they're building another bridge there. So they've got a number of these bridges across the uh, Banana River. And this is uh, just one of the latest. 
the Warbird uh, Museum, unfortunately, on this occasion, I didn't go. In 2010, I did go, and I watched this character called Snort, Dale Snodgrass. That's his uh, F-86 sabre. And seriously, he would have been about 20 metres off the ground when, he, when I took that picture in 2010. There he is, but unfortunately, in 2021, he actually uh, died. He, he died in a plane accident. Uh, but I guess he was always pushing the envelope, as they say. And some of these pictures are quite famous, uh, particularly the uh, F-14 down the bottom. That was him flying that. Uh, so he was a bit of a daredevil. So lots of signs around there that say Kennedy Space Centre. So you know when you're in, you know, people often ask me, did you go to Disneyland? I said, well, I was in Disneyland didn't have to go to. Uh, the other thing that saved my bacon when I was staying at Merritt Island was the Tiki Bar. It was only about, uh, you know, 40 metres away. <laughs> and uh, at night you could go there and have, uh, have a bit of a drink and relax a little bit. So from um, the next day, uh, from the accreditation office, this is where things get serious now because I've got all the badges. I'm ready to go from the, I drive down to the press accreditation office, which is heading north from where I'm staying. And we go to the vertical assembly building in the media center. And we all arrive at that place, all the internationals, and we get on a bus. And there's the, there's the bus. <laughs> and you kind of drive in there and that's one of the first views you see. Pretty spectacular. Awesome building. Everything's nicely painted, all refreshed. The only place that wasn't was when I got to Johnson Space, Spacecraft Center in Houston. That was a little bit run down, but everything in Florida, beautiful Nick. Um, that picture there is launch pad 39B, and that's the little circle. I don't know if you can see it, but that little dot is Artemis 1 sitting on a pad. So that's the first thing, you, as soon as the bus drives in, your eye, you're looking for it. Ah, there it is. And there's another picture of Artemis 1 on 39B. That water in front is the, uh, if you know when they bring in the boosters from Michoud in New, uh, in Louisiana, they park the, the, the big boat there and they pull the boosters out at that point. And then they drag them into the vertical assembly building for erection. Um, of course, we all know the, the clock. That's pad 39A. They are SpaceX towers. The, one, the, the tower on the left is the original space shuttle Apollo 39A. And the one on the right is the new Starship tower that's being built there. And as, as we speak today, it's uh, topped out. They've actually got it to its full extent. They'll probably spend another six months fitting out the internals, putting in the chopsticks and a few other bits and pieces. But that's the famous clock. Not the old clock you remember from Apollo, but the clock, uh, the new clock that they use for the countdown. Um, you'll see a picture here of uh, Slack or Space Launch Complex 41. That's the ULA launch site. That's where Starliner uh, launches from uh, eventually. And uh, the building just to the right is the service structure that uh, supports pad 41 when you get to the media center you'll see uh you'll see this some they have press conferences and they have the uh kennedy space center as a backdrop and you're walking up the from the bus and they've got uh, this is where they do their if you watch uh, the nasa press conferences they do it in this building here and then you get inside the press uh center and Everyone sits there and um, watches that TV that you can see at top, uh, middle right-hand side to see what the latest status of the uh, mission is. <coughs> Excuse me. There it is again. They've got some beautiful models in there. I like this one in particular. That stands at about uh, two metres tall. Wouldn't fit in a suitcase. So. Um, we watch the TV often to get status updates on what's going on, what interviews you can conduct, all those sorts of things in the media center. 
And when you go outside, they were doing the interviews and you bump into certain people like this gentleman here, Doug Hurley. Um, talk about him in a sec. And then, of course, there's Charlie Blackwell Thomas, and she's the NASA Artemis Once launch director. You'll often hear discussion about Charlie made the call. That's who Charlie is. She had some tough decisions. That's me and a mate that I met down there. Uh, the NASA administrator, Bill, Bill Nelson. I was standing, he, come, he comes in all the time, right? And in the media center, just walks around. And uh, he, he looked at me and had a bunch of people and he greeted me like a long lost brother. So I don't know what, what it was. And then when I started talking, he probably said, oh yeah, I like the accent and uh, we got to chatting. So he was pretty cool. The other guy that I, I sort of hijacked just as he was coming out of the toilet was uh, <laughs> Doug Hurley. And he was pretty, he was pretty cool. He's a, he's a gentleman. I figured out if you're an astronaut, uh, you've got to have that ability to be a public relations man. If you are not, and you don't get on with people, you're not going to be an astronaut. You're just not going to qualify. And these guys, every astronaut I met was a gentleman. They really were. And he, him in particular. Now, Doug Hurley, he's STS-127, uh, 135, the last shuttle flight. Uh, and he was on... Um, um, the SpaceX uh, demonstration mission number two. So he, him and uh, Bob um, flew on that mission, which was the first SpaceX launch, crewed launch, and the first from the end of the space shuttle, which was what, nine years later. So pretty cool. The Friday came along. Now, remember the launch is on the Monday. So this is the Friday before. This is that building that I showed you. That's where the press conferences happen. And you can see Charlie's there and Doug's there. And that was one of the number of press conferences I attended. This is a gentleman called Chris Gebhardt. Some of you guys will know him. Um, he's NASA Space Flight News. He's uh, pretty big on, uh, on YouTube and the, and the net. Um, they, they're huge. They've got cameras everywhere. You know, Boca Chica, uh, Vandenberg, uh, Kennedy and uh, he, uh, we, Michael and I and Peter met him in 2010 when the solid rocket boosters came in for STS-132 and he was there and uh, so I reacquainted myself with him and he was good, good to talk to, interesting fella. Then I met uh, Lars Oz, he was Norwegian uh, Broadcasting Corporation, uh, I called him the crazy Viking, he was a great character. Uh, and the, the reason why I show you these pictures is because of the, to, to reflect on the amount of people that I met. The amount of people that I met at this place was just unbelievable from all you know, walks of life. It was just a, a terrific experience, even though the rocket didn't go up. Uh, here's the Artemis space flight suit. It's a modified space shuttle suit, but uh, it's there in all its glory. And that's what the Artemis astronauts will use. From the media building, if you wanted to go to get some lunch down the NASA cafeteria, you had to get escorted. And fortunately, there were some, uh, you know, the NASA people were absolutely awesome. They looked after you as best they could, and they always were there willing to help out. So I was very appreciative of it. If they could do anything with the heat and the humidity that was there, would have been fantastic. But uh, my most in, in enduring memory of the trip was the heat and humidity. Um, it was tough, really tough. Uh, Florida, worst time to be launching rockets is in summer. Um, if you launch in the morning between, you know, seven o'clock in the morning to say 11, you're doing all right. After that, that's Rafferty's rules. Uh, all of a sudden storms, lightning, thunder, the whole thing, just um, the weather just cracks up. So when the scrubs occurred and we had the launches later in the day, everyone started to get worried about the, uh, the, the weather. In fact, 
the latest data must launch. I, I just read an article just a few minutes back that uh, the hurricane is now uh, forming that's heading to Florida. So the suspicions are that they will roll Artemis back into the VAB, which I'm sure will make a lot of engineers happy, but that's another story. <laughs> <coughs> Amazing the wildlife you see there. That's right near the media compound. He just sits there and he's quite happy. And there's, again, if you get a picture about three o'clock in the afternoon, it, it actually comes up quite nice. You can see Artemis there in the, uh, in the background. Saturday came along. Um, Again, great pictures. If you, I put a circle around it, but that was Slack 40. And we had a Falcon 9 with Starlinks on board on the pad, ready to launch that Sunday. Uh, there it is again. Now, I befriended, I was the media, but I didn't have any cameras. So pretty much I had to be in a compound. But I befriended this guy, Greg Harland. He's a NASA PA US Air Force uh, Pacific uh, PA and uh, Cat Herder, Pad Guru. This guy would uh, basically herd all the media together, both international and locals, and uh, bring them out to all the various locations to set up their cameras. And this would happen every morning. Put them up, put them down, put them up, put them down. And with, with scrubs, you can imagine the the, the frenet frenetic activity that would occur. But he, I befriended him and he allowed me to go for a ride, even though I didn't have a camera, um, which was great, which meant I could get closer to the rocket. Uh, here's someone that people might know from YouTube, uh, Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. If you watch YouTube or you on the internet, this guy's famous. Then I met another guy from NASA Space Flight News. He's famous too, uh, Nick Ann Sweeney. He's from um, Boca, and if you watch some of the NASA Space Flight News uh, commentaries from Boca, you'll see his name on the bottom. So Nick's permanently down Houston. And then I, I met Jacques from Netherlands. Uh, he had cameras and uh, another good bloke. Again, got to know a lot of the uh, international people because we were all in the same bus. And here we are driving down towards Pad 39. We pass a SpaceX facility at pad 39A. Um, and then we get to our first stop. And uh, interestingly enough, this is looking from this mound, looking towards the left is the uh, SpaceX Starship structure. To the right is the, what is now the Falcon 9 a launch complex bit of controversy here because nasa's not really happy that they've got the starship launch pad so close to uh what is essentially america's only uh pad that will launch crew to the space station or into space so what they're worried about is that starship blowing up and uh, pretty much destroying their access to space there's no way they're going back to the russians so uh, they guard that pad uh, quite critically. And Michael, in the tour that we did in 2010, uh, we actually came to this spot and we were looking towards Atlantis at that stage. Oh, sorry, there's the VAB. And there's some Butte 3D cameras around, fantastic uh, pieces of equipment. They scatter the, the countryside there. And here we are with Artemis and we're about, I don't know, 500 meters away, half a kilometer. So that's, that's pretty good. That's as close as I probably got to the, to the rocket. And there's my newfound buddy, Greg Harland. And we went to another spot. Again, cameras are being set up there. There's uh, launch pad 39B looking from behind. Another spot. Looking side on, there I am. There it is again. And so beautiful views when you're there. Wow. 
There you go. And again, you look, and again, you're looking at back pad 39A. The bus is coming back. There's the crane still installing the structure. There's the SpaceX building. And this is one of the two crawlers that they have. One crawler was, uh, I'm not actually sure if that was the one that actually took Artemis out to the pad 39B, but uh, it was there and it's big. And this is the launch clock before the launch, 41 hours to go. They started the countdown two days beforehand. Again, another panel and uh, you'll see Bill there again in a, and uh, what's her name, Lauders? Kathy Lauders? Yeah. Two Canadians, Canadian astronauts. They've been in with NASA for a long time. Australia should have done the same. Artemis 2, there will be two Americans. Uh, Artemis 2, by the way, is the uh, Apollo 8 rerun, right? Go and do a free, free return. In fact, it's not even an Apollo 8. They will do a free return trajectory back to the Earth. There'll be two Americans fly that, one European Space Agency astronaut and one Canadian. So they take their partners seriously. In fact, that's their protection against Congress killing off the program. If you've got all these international agreements, that's part of the plan, you see. Sunday came along, back to the Tiki Bar. Uh, clam chowder, love it. Best clam chowder I've ever had. And the cocktails weren't too bad. Sail the boat, perfect place. Watch the dolphins. Dolphins come in and out of that river. And if you go down the road a little bit further, you get to Port Canaveral, you'll see a, a really toasty uh, uh, Falcon 9 standing there in the middle. And that was one that got sent back. Another one came in a few days later, which I'll show you. The Monday, this was the launch day. So we all got up at about one o'clock in the morning, 12.30, uh, for a launch at eight o'clock that morning. And the reason why you had to get up at that hour was because you had to miss the traffic because the traffic was pretty much unbearable at the time. So I was there at about probably one o'clock. That was a bit tough, but hey. And we kept watching this TV screen to see what the latest status was. And you go outside, it was still dark. The Artemis was lit up. And uh, again, you see astronauts everywhere. This guy, was of particular relevance to me. Having an Italian background, this was Luca Parmitano. He's Expedition 61, 36, 60, Soyuz M13, Expedition 37, Soyuz uh, 09M. This guy has a wealth of experience, uh, European Space Agent, Agency astronaut. And that's me and him having a chat. And this is uh, him in his uh, space suit. And he's actually, that's a walking space that he's, He's done several spacewalks. Interesting character. Again, we're watching this. On the morning, the first problem was there was lightning. So they had to, they only had a two hour launch window. So they had to try to fill this thing after the lightning stopped. So that delayed them to begin with. Then they had hydrogen leak. Sound familiar? Little one. Then they had some ice building up in a crack and they weren't sure if they had a cracked tank. Turns out it wasn't. Um, then they had a reading that showed they tried to chill the engine. So what happens is they tried to fill the hydrogen up automatically. That wasn't working. They were getting too much uh, uh, hydrogen escaping and leaking. So then they took over manual control. And they let it warm up, cool down a bit. And then they have two pipes. One fills up the tanks. The other one does the bleed system. The bleed system basically runs hydrogen through the engines to uh, condition them before they start. 
Um, one engine, engine three, didn't get chilled to the right temperature. There are a whole number of circumstances of what happened, but it turns out that it was probably a faulty sensor. So when I'm saying that the Artemis one will go back to the VAB over the next day or so because of the hurricane, the engineers will be happy to look at some of these things and try to fix these up. And there we have the countdown going on. It's now early morning. The sun is uh, coming up. Uh, by that stage, they pretty much ran out of launch window and they had to call a scrub. Charlie says, no, nope, we're not flying today. And there was going to be a press conference not long thereafter. And the decision was made to fly attempt again three days later. So on Tuesday, back to the Tiki Bar. Beautiful place. Loved it. You know, everything space related around the Cape. The, they don't call it the Space Coast for nothing. Um, along the Banana River, bridges. Um, that's where I was. I then moved to Titusville. I only had the house for a, about a week and then I moved to Titusville. I was a bit disappointed in that because the Merritt Island uh, accommodation was fantastic. Uh, and in fact, Titusville was a bit uh, further away from Kennedy Space Centre and the action. So I'd highly recommend, if, if any of, of you guys go, highly recommend this place. It's in a perfect spot. Right near uh, Port Canaveral, Jetty Park, right not far from Cocoa Beach as well. So ideal spot. That was the house in uh, Titusville. And it was the place was called To The Moon. As, as you would expect. <laughs> then I went to the Space Walk of Fame in Titusville. Uh, you always go and do the pil pilgrimage up there. This is the Mercury uh, Memorial. And uh, there you have Shepherd's Flight dedicated in the, uh, in the paving. And um, great views. That's the bridge that goes across to Playa Linda Beach uh, on Merritt Island. And there's Gordo's hands, and I think my hands are bigger than Gordo's. There's the bridge, and here's a little jetty that goes out. And I met this character. Uh, this was George Ray, he's chairman of the board of La Lafayette, and his daughter Michelle, who's an attorney, uh, attorney, attorney, attorney in uh, Florida, in California. This guy. His company makes the tubes that uh, line the RS-25 engines and the RL-10 engines. And his company is still making them. And they have been since the 60s. So this guy was no, he was right embedded with uh, the Artemis project. And uh, he, he just does a lot of, he's elderly now, uh, but uh, his company is still doing this work. And I was, I was amazed. And that's me and him. The people you bump into. Then I went to the American Space Museum in Titusville. In 2010, we went in there and it was just an old broken down shack, uh, but uh, they've moved and it's great. You'll see all sorts of rocket engines and models out the front and there's the entry. And of course, there's the merchandising section, which you'll always find a good t-shirt or two. I think I ended up with about three after this mission. Add to another six that I've got at home. So great models, but there's a lot of interesting memorabilia that goes back to the Apollo days too. Like some of those uh, contractor, you know, models that came from Grumman. And then of course, you've got these panels. <clears throat> if anyone's into this uh, electronic stuff, this is mind blowing. These are rocket engines, Dave. These were 300 mil diameter rocket engines in carbon fiber tubing you can see the nozzle at the back and uh, there, there's something like a i don't know a q engine or something so boy they don't do things in half half measures then i met this guy called darren roberts and he was a ex-pastor and uh, he was there to teach kids technology and he would uh he, he talked to me a lot about 3d printing but he was all about uh, STEM, 
teaching the young kids around Titusville all about technology. And he'd make all this stuff out of uh, electronics. You know, they'd get all their Raspberry Pis and their Arduinos and they'd do their programming and they'd make all these little robots. And uh, he was an absolutely amazing character to talk with. He was a fascinating bloke. Wednesday, uh, time to go to the visitor center. So we headed off to the visitor center. There's a nice little wall dedicated to John F. Kennedy and his um, commitment to go to the moon. And my favorite spot I was just about is the rocket garden here. They are beautifully kept. $75 to go in, by the way. Get your yearly pass for 145 US dollars, talking real dollars here. Yeah. And um, um, it, it means you can go in and out over the, the X days. But uh, that rocket garden, it, you pay $75 to get in, but they keep it immaculately clean and maintained. All those rockets are just beautifully painted. And it's great to see that they, they are preserving the, the heritage. I'm going to race through this because I've got more slides and not enough time. There's an F1 engine. Huge. There's a Saturn 1B. Brilliant. There's the old redstone. Every time I look at this, uh, the, the, the bottom of this, it reminds me of the uh, German V2 rocket because that's exactly where it came from. You'll see the uh, control vanes at the bottom, the red bits. The Jupiter C, the Delta's there. So it's a great place to be. But what struck me was the Orion capsule. That capsule, you know, it, it's not Apollo. This is Apollo on steroids. This is a five meter uh, heat shield. And one of the main objectives of Artemis One is to actually uh, send that through the atmosphere at 25,000 miles an hour and see if it survives. So that'll be an interesting task. The other thing, of course, is the Atlantis building and the space shuttle, Atlantis. And, um, you know, it, Atlantis and I go back a long time because I watched it launch and I've seen it fly back and I've seen the boosters. I've seen it in the sky. I've met astronauts that flew on it. So it's just one of those uh, sh shuttles that close to your heart. I was stuffed by then. The heat was killing me. There's the payload bay, door, the wing, the pod, the Ames pods, the engine, the RS-25s. Beautiful engines. Absolutely superb. Tail fin. There's an RS-25 engine. And I should have taken a picture and shown you the little tubes that that man made that lines the, the engine. There's the cockpit. And this is the thing that strikes you when you, uh, at the bottom of Atlantis, the sheer size of the underbelly and the tiles there, just mind-blowing. It really, pictures don't do it justice. That was the mission that I saw, so I took the badge. And that's uh, Robert Crippen's STS-1 flight suit. As you know, him and John Young were the first to fly the uh, space shuttle in 81, I think. April 81, uh, first test flight, manned, gutsy stuff. Would never happen again, I don't think. I don't know what Gemini this is. Oh, sorry, uh, Mercury this is. It's on a redstone. And there's um, Alan Shepard in one of the buildings. That's Deke Slayton's jacket. There's a Gemini capsule. I don't know which Gemini it is. Thursday, 40 hours, sorry, 40 minutes to go. <laughs> I went down on that day, but there was nothing really going on. So I decided to go to the uh, Walk of Fame and finish that walk. This is the Ge uh, Gemini. Um, memorial. And this is um, on my birthday in 1965. That's my earliest memory of space. Um, so this was again point, poignant to me because um, at that time when I was, what was it? I was nine years old, eight years old. 
uh, that was my first memory of being interested in space. Never looked back from that point. There's the Apollo Memorial. On the Friday, uh, went to the beach. Another view of Atlantis, different view again. Beautiful Atlantic coast. Notice the sky's blue. That's <laughs> not always the case there. And you walk about uh, a kilometre up the beach and you get to where pad 39B roughly is. And where pad 39C will be, won't be called 39C, it'll be called 49 and it'll be built by SpaceX. In fact, there are structures at Roberts Road, not far from here, that uh, have actually uh, steel structures that are getting ready to build the tower. Uh, now, I don't know, I've heard rumours that uh, we got structural steel there, but I haven't seen it yet. So it's interesting. So they, they will build another pad. There it is. You can see the pad in the background. Beautiful long beach. And you can see that through the tower. Artemis there. Again, plenty of wildlife. Got to talking to these guys. And you could see uh, manatees, are they? They're manat Yeah, they're all in the water. Pretty amazing. Then I went to Dixie Crossroads. Um, that's a little restaurant. Had another clam chowder. Not as good as the other one. Saturday. Day before the the launch, actually, is that Saturday the 3rd? Yes, that was actually the second attempt, launch attempt. That flight was, I think, uh, about 1.30 in the afternoon. So we got there about six in the morning. And again, we're looking at this, but the reports on the day were, they're getting hydrogen leaks. So again, they go from automatic into manual mode. As soon as they go into manual mode, somehow there was a pressure surge through the pipes. No one said much after that, other than they couldn't fix the leak thereafter and they had to terminate the count. My suspicion is, which you will not hear about, is that that pressure surge probably wrecked the seals. They've got soft seals on these, uh, on the quick disconnect arms that uh, uh, feed the rocket. And uh, my suspicion is that that wrecked it. But again, NASA won't tell you this. NASA keep their cards pretty close to their, to their chest. But consequences uh, canceled the launch. And that was it for the next attempt. Gone. They were then deciding whether they had to bring the uh, rocket back into the vertical assembly building to fix. But what they did was they did the smart thing. They decided to fix it on the pad. Now, they've got no structure to be able... If you remember the shuttle, they had a big structure that they could roll, swing around to attend to the, to the space shuttle. Uh, and Apollo had a huge structure. They don't have one. You know, it's uh, it's um, what what it's a moon rocket on a budget, so they had to build a scaffold, right, to be able to get to the uh, engines and uh, the quick disconnect arm. So uh, they did. They tested it again. They couldn't get the auto fill to work. They had to stuff around with um, manual load. Again, to me, it feels like. A wing and a prayer. They they decided that they were going to launch on the 27th. The hurricane has put an end to that. They're going to have to roll back to the VAB. Next launch opportunity is probably in October. Uh, but again, they still haven't resolved the issue of the leaks properly. They think they've got workarounds and procedures, but time will tell whether they've fixed it or not. Sad to say, but this is not your father's Apollo. But having said that, your father's Apollo also killed three astronauts on the pad because they didn't take into account a liquid oxygen environment and a fire. So I, I don't know. And it was, the flight was terminated at two hours before launch and that was the end of that.
So that was the end of my mission. Uh, and then they, at the end, they'd bring in this uh, astronaut uh, who's Victor Glover. He actually flew on X, uh, SpaceX crew mission one amongst others. And he basically gave people a bit of a, a pep talk, the media and a bit of a rundown on what was going on. But again, they never really answer the hard questions. They just give you the, you know, the simple man's version of we'll be right and we'll fly when we're ready. Bill Nelson, right? We'll fly when we're ready. Sunday, this time, another Tiki Barber down, that's uh, down Cocoa Beach. That's my uh, son and his girlfriend. They came down and I, I looked at that and said, this is a perfect spot because if you look on the right, you've got slack 16 is, is visible and that's relativity, relativity space. In the middle is slack 36, which is blue origin. So when they launched the new Glen, imagine the view along that beach. Awesome. And then you've got slack 46, which is the Astra launch pads. So that, that's Missile Alley, by the way, up that, up that stretch going from right uh, up towards your left. There was a little dedication to um, Challenger. Then we went uh, with my son and his girlfriend, we went to the uh, Apollo, the NASA uh, Saturn V center. You go into this room, you get a bit of a story about Apollo. Then you go to the actual mission control that actually launched Apollo. And then you walk in through the door and you get hit by this. And this is one of those enduring memories and an awesome sight. Five F1 engines at the bottom of a Saturn V. And you see this Saturn V. It's just awesome. Absolutely awesome. And to, there's a lunar module. And to think that this was done in the 60s is even more mind-boggling. Lunar Rover. This is the Apollo 14, uh, uh, what they call it, the rickshaw. And this is Eugene Cernan's Apollo 17 moon suit. There's Apollo 17. And this is the bus back to the visitor center. Then we go back to Atlantis. But there's this particular building called the Gateway Building. In there, that is uh, a Falcon Heavy side booster hanging up in the roof. It's huge, absolutely huge. And there are the, the legs. But there's other things. Because it's Gateway, there's other models in there. For example, there's Vulcan. And of course, Dream Chaser. You know, full size, hanging from the ceiling. Looks great. And there's the uh, shooting star, unpressurized component of uh, star. And there's, of course, Orion with its heat tiles. And there we have the Atlas V uh, with the CST-100. And there's a sort of a, a bolster, not a bolster, a plywood mock-up, but there's the real SpaceX um, Cargo Dragon 1, version 1. This is a night launch of a SpaceX uh, Starlink mission. And you wait there and the whole sky lights up and the rocket goes up and uh, fantastic. Now, because I was parallel with the flight path, all as I saw was the rocket really go straight up, get up to about 85 degrees, and that was it. I did see staging, didn't see the uh, boost back burn, but apparently you could have if you looked hard. Um, I had to clear out because we were not far from the south entry to Kennedy Space Center, and apparently if the guards see that you're watching a launch, they come and grab you. So I had to keep all the lights down and, you know, keep the voices down and just hear the mozzies flying around your head. Incredible. Monday the 5th, I think I didn't do anything to do with space on that day. The 6th, I went to this fireworks. They sell fireworks. Have a look at this place. It's a supermarket with fireworks. This is a pyromaniac's, you know, uh, <laughs> dream home. And I looked at all these rockets and thought, oh, gee, I could launch so many rockets with those. <laughs> and of course, you have to go down to Merritt Island, down to Cocoa Beach, right down the end, and see I Dream of Jeannie Lane. <laughs> it wasn't much, but it was, <laughs> it was there. Uh, from there, I went to Jetty Park. 
And this is the entry to Port Canaveral. And you can see uh, Launch Complex 36. People are fishing. Don't know what they catch, but they're there. Hot as hell. I don't know why you'd be out there. And there's a lot of markers. That Florida ran Texas for various uh, uh, battles. This was the Battle of uh, Revolutionary War here in Florida. One of the last battles of the Re Revolutionary War. And the big ships. For the launch, they had about four ships there. These things are monsters. Huge. And of course, there's a SpaceX booster uh, that had come in. This is Exploration Tower at Port Canaveral. On the Wednesday, I took a trip on a helicopter. I had a, a, an acquaintance of Marcus House. Um, he's a photographer called Greg Scott. He does pictures for Marcus and he does pictures for Lab Padre. These are guys that you'll see on YouTube that do a lot of reporting on space and Boca Chica. So that's uh, Greg in, uh, on the right-hand side. And that's Marcus House when I saw him in July in Launceston, when Mike, uh, Peter and I went down there. So Marcus put me on to Greg. And so there's me looking like a pilot, but I wasn't, I was sitting in the back seat. And um, as we fly over, what do we see? We see a SpaceX Dragon in the water. They're testing uh, recoveries. <coughs> Uh, here we go. There's the ship, and the uh, dragon is on the back of the boat. Really cool. And there it is across the water. There's a uh, Falcon booster. And this is Kennedy Space Center as you're approaching it. This is Robert's Road. This is where you will see up to the top middle, there's one more section that was to go on the SpaceX launch pad 39A. And uh, you can see the star factory progressing at a rapid rate. That's increased double again since that picture was taken. They work at an incredible speed and they work 24 hours a day at SpaceX. Incredible. There's the VAB as you fly around it. There's the shuttle landing strip. Uh, this is the visitor center at the bottom right and Blue Origin at the top. Same thing, but through the helicopter, there's that exploration tower. And we go past the little lagoon where ULA are hanging out. And there's two, two little circles. On the left, look like a CST-100 Starliner in the water. So they were testing that. On the right, there's a booster that's come out of that ship. I, to me, that looks like a Delta booster, but, I, but I'm not 100% sure because I thought it was a Delta that was going to fly the other day, but that flew from Vandenberg. So this must be the last Delta that they have. Uh, anyway, that's my theory. I, it looks certainly not a Vulcan and certainly not an Atlas booster. It's too big for that. So it can only be a Delta. Uh, again, you'll see there's the Falcon 9 on its side. And this is a nuclear submarine pen, believe it or not. No nukes were, nuclear subs were there on the day, but, Trident. sorry? Trident. Yes. Have you? Yeah. With a submarine? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, that's cool. And here you are, we finished our trip. Then we went to Gators. This is one of the many watering holes they have around Port Canaveral. And uh, you can see a camera there. That is the live stream that you can get from Greg Scott. And you can uh, see the, the boosters, Falcon boosters coming in. And there's me and Greg having a, about to have some lunch and a few drinks. And there it is, like, uh, the booster lying on its side. And if you look closely at this picture, you'll see a fairing being lifted off. Uh, that's either Doug or Bob. They've got two ships named after Doug Hurley and uh, Bob Benkin. And um, yeah, hive of activity that day on Port, at Port Canaveral it was excellent. On the Thursday, I flew to Houston. I'm going to race through this now. And eventually I'd end up at Boca Chica. So at Houston, again, you know, breakfast, 
or dinner or lunch, one of the, two, one of the three. But again, space related. Uh, Kamala Harris came to, the vice president came to Kennedy Space Center to watch the first aborted launch. She was there on that day to, under, uh, to basically chair the Space Council meeting, number two. Um, I didn't see her, but uh, that was at Johnson Space Center. Fantastic, 747 with uh, a mock-up shuttle on the top. But they've also got a Falcon 9 booster there. That's big. Looks great. And you can see the results of using RP1 uh, fuel, which is highly carbon-based. So when you do the retrofire, all the carbon just basically cakes onto the, um, to the rocket. And interesting, if you've seen the, the one that's launched the most, uh, I think it's a .14 uh, launch. It's almost black. You can't see anything behind it. Uh, it's quite amazing. But they fly. And there are the grid fins and the front. Now, on the Saturday, the 10th, I drove down to Boca Chica. And about five minutes from uh, you get Brownsville. You, you drive from Houston down to Corpus Christi, then across to Brownsville. Now, you think Brownsville is a town like Seymour. Nothing like it. Brownsville is a town like Geelong, big, uh, maybe even bigger. And then from Brownsville, that's a five and a half hour drive from Houston. Then from there is another half an hour to get to Boca Chica, which is some people just like to call it Starbase. But you can see on the left, you can see the buildings appear. That's the uh, production site of Boca Chica. As they get closer, there's Starbase and you get to the rocket garden. And this is ship 20, never flew, but it's fully tiled. Rumor has it that not all those tiles are real. They were there for a bit of show maybe, but hey, I don't know if the rumor's real. And in between we had ship 16, which also didn't fly. I'll come back because I come back the ne next day and do, do this again. There's the, um, the high bays, one still being constructed. This is the beach. I thought I'd go to the beach and see nobody there. Just a bit of rubbish on the, the ground. I was wrong. There were lots of people the day I went to the beach. The locals use it. They, a lot of the locals complained about SpaceX closing off the road, right? Because there's only one road that goes to their public beach. And that's this beach is only, um, you know, 300 metres from the launch, launch site. So they closed the beach and the public can't access it. So they complained and hence the requirements for the FAA on SpaceX uh, that they must comply and not use close a road too often, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it gets really complicated. Not all the locals, even though most of the locals like what SpaceX have done at Brownsville because they've given them employment, um, uh, but not all locals have been supportive. Unfortunately for Brownsville, um, Elon's already made the call that he's going to be flying out of the Cape and this will slowly wind itself down and the locals can thank the FAA for being very, very difficult. Now, maybe I'm being harsh, uh, but I think they were very difficult. So there they are at the beach. Also, Elon Musk had to prepare written notes about the Civil War. The last battle of the Civil War was fought here, right on these beaches. And it was done 30 days after Lee had surrendered, um, after Lee had surrendered. The Confederates actually won this battle, but too late because they lost the war. And so Elon Musk has to preserve the historic site and actually record and maintain a lot of the um, Civil War relics there. You'll see trucks parked on the side of the road. These are people like Lab Padre, like NASA Space Flight News, that actually have got cameras mounted on their trucks, permanently looking at the rockets. And you can see live streams 24 hours a day of what's going on down there. And there's uh, Booster 7. Um, that has since had a static fire test, seven engines, and it's been taken back to the, uh, the, the buildings for... Uh, what do they call it? Robustness 
uh, increasing the robustness of the of the rocket. This could be the one that goes to orbit. There it is. This is a, a test article, 7.1. Uh, they basically put it in that jig on the left and then they compress it and uh, really calculate the ultimate stress loads on these things and uh, work their way through it. There's Starhopper. You remember, water tanks can fly. There it is. Still sits there and it carries all these instruments on top and cameras and things. And you can see Starship uh, on the right there. There it is. That's uh, Starship 24. That recently had six engine fire. Uh, some tiles came off, which is an interesting thing. The latest theory is because it's so low to the ground with six engines firing, it sent some of the concrete up and wrecked some of the tiles. But I'm not sure that's true. I hope it is because the last thing you need is for this thing to fire up and tiles have fallen off it. It's never going to re-enter doing that sort of stuff. So anyway, there it is. It's huge. And again, historical sites. This is Lab Padre's camera setup. He's got a beautiful uh, setup. And you, again, you can watch all this stuff live. This is a little canteen. He's used the fins to provide sunshades. Uh, he's got some tracking stations there. It's quite interesting. You can walk around this site. You can't go inside it, but you can walk around it, no problem. And the security people actually, they don't encourage you, but they don't, you know, they're not like NASA people, you know, with their hand on the, on the gun. These guys let you walk around. They're really good. And, and credit to Elon Musk for that, I must say. There's the rocket garden. Again, we've got uh, Booster 5, ne never flew, but SN15, which is the one from left to right, uh, that flew. That was the first one to actually land after it did its 12 kilometer flight. And then we had uh, ship 16 and ship 20, which never flew. That's me just to prove that I was there. Uh, I think I'm, uh, I'm probably, geez, I'm well over time here. I'll quickly race through these. Sunday, Rocket Ranch, place to stay on the Rio Grande. Uh, again, historic markers. The worry I had though, was when I went to some of these ranches, there was a sign on the thing that says, beware, there's illegal immigrants around here. They are dangerous and they're armed. And I thought, holy cow, not a place to be. <laughs> but there's Starbase, the rocket garden again, me standing in front of it. That's the, uh, uh, the stress tester, booster. There it is again. Boca Chica Village was what's left of it. I think that's the wall. Just beyond that wall is the Rio Grande. That wall, I think, is Mr. Trump's wall. Why would you put a wall like that? I don't know if you can see it properly. Why would you put a wall like that there? I know that the um, Homeland Security had actually visited SpaceX to see what they had to do, but perhaps they wanted to extend the, the wall uh, you know, and then along came the 2020 election and that was the end of that. But um, I think it's there and I think it's Mr. Trump's wall. Then I went to Johnson Space Center. I had a NASA VIP tour. I'll race through this. Lunar module, fantastic. Great murals. We went into a, a space shuttle facility. I didn't know this, but when they flew space shuttles, they had a, uh, an identical replica on the bottom without the walls. And they had all the wiring, there it is, all available. So if something happened, they were flying the mission on the ground too. If something happened, they knew which wire to move and what, what wire to, do, to connect. Let me tell you, the, the amount of wires here was just unbelievable. There it is. That's the cargo bay without the walls. There's a flight deck. Then we went to the building seven, which was the, um, they basically do the space suits. They were going nowhere with their lunar spacesuit, as you know, and they awarded the contracts, or they put them out to bid to Collins and Axiom Space. The day I, I was there, they had announced that Axiom Space had won the lunar spacesuits, but the space station spacesuits, Collins will probably get that. So, you know, they're, they're um, not putting all their eggs in one basket. And there's a 
couple of pictures that I took. Uh, th they have every space walk in that, in that building. And this is Luca Parmitano, who I'd met, and is, of course, uh, our favourite uh, space association, Charles, Charles, Charlie Duke, and, of course, Neil Armstrong and Eugene Cernan, another space association uh, favourite. And there was obviously memorials to the, to the fallen astronauts, a moon suit. And then we go to mission control. This is behind the wall. And Jerry Griffin, those that were fortunate enough to meet him, this was uh, Apollo 13 picture, very famous, with a cigar in his mouth. Gene Kranz was next to him. Again, mission control, as it was back in the day, in the 60s. Um, but because we had the VIP tour that cost about $300, real dollars, uh, we were able to go inside that room. And it was pretty uh, awesome, I must say. And they had, um, you know, the lunar landing on the screens and the visuals, and it was awesome. When you went outside the room, they've got all the shuttle uh, emblems there. Then we went to actual mission control space station. That was operating at the time. Uh, then we had a look around the museum. Pete Conrad suit. Skylab. Apparently there were two Skylabs. One went up and one was supposed to go up. Another one. Uh, the other one that was supposed to go up that didn't is here at uh, Johnson Space Spacecraft Centre. Is that right, Andrew? I think you're right. Andrew just corrected me. The actual Skylab B is in Washington. It's actually in the Smithsonian. So this must be a mock-up. Yeah. Beautiful. Great. Really big size. These moon rocks they have on display. Lunar Rover. A couple of astronauts uh, on the moon. And this is Apollo 17. A Gemini capsule. And here's the space shuttle sitting on top of the plane. This is inside the aircraft. Big, huge. And this is the walkway where the uh, astronauts used to go on the space shuttle and the white room. This is the cafeteria. Great place to have a, a burger, and, as you would, and uh, look at the murals. Fantastic. Then you go into this particular room where they've got a lot of the mock-ups of up, upcoming gateways and CST-100s and... Now, this is an actual Soyuz that they use for training, but it's an actual flyable Soyuz that the Russians gave them. They might want it back, but I don't know. CST-100. And they had, I didn't put a picture in here, but I had one. They had uh, the uh, lunar module. They had the um, Dynetics uh, alpaca there, a mock-up of that. And they also had the national team huge uh, lunar lander there. But of course, they're all now going for the sustainable program and they're all getting redesigned, a lot of them. The Saturn V building, there's an F1 engine. This is the only flyable Saturn V that they've actually got. The one at Marshall and the one at Kennedy were not flyable. They just bought bits, in, uh, bits and pieces. This was an actual flyable Saturn V, which didn't fly, of course, but Again, awesome just to see it. Then I went to Rudy's, um, you know, in Texas. You go and do the, the brisket slash, what did, you know, barbecue, Texas barbecue. And I caught up with a guy who I'd met in 2010 called Mana Vortia. He's one of the locals just across the ditch there from New Zealand. He's now a USA citizen. He reckons he'll apply to be an astronaut one last time. Um, he's a great guy and um, we'll um, maybe for the space show we'll do an interview with him and um, and uh, bring him um, and, and you'll hear his story he's a, he's a, an ex amazing character local boy done good good story and of course you can't leave Texas without eating one of those I saw this plane flying up near Ellington Air Force Base and it, to me it looked like a drone and sure as eggs, I was in Rudy's and I see this picture. 
of the 147th attack wing. Sure as eggs, they're flying those drones. Those drones, I've seen one in the air. So that confirmed. This house in our Largo, any, anyone want to guess whose house that was? Try Neil Armstrong's. Two suburbs, our Largo, and there was another one um, just next door. They were about 15 minutes from Johnson Spacecraft Center. And Neil left that house in 71, 72, I think. But uh, there it was in a really cute little suburb with trees. And this is Taylor Lake Village. That's where a lot of the early astronauts, the Mercury astronauts. And in fact, some of these suburbs that got uh, built up were as a consequence of the astronauts going there. Uh, then I went, uh, this was my last day there, and I went to a couple of the battle sites, San Jacinto. This was a site, uh, remember the Alamo? The Mexicans slaughtered uh, the Americans, and they slaughtered them in uh, another place. In there. Well, Jacinto, it was remember the Alamo where the Americans slaughtered the uh, Mexicans and won their um, independence from Mexico. This was the battle site, and there's a huge monument that's just a little bit bigger than the Washington Monument in Washington. And Tuesday, get on a plane. And on Thursday, I'm back to Melbourne with a traffic jam, but not on the road I was on. So that was my trip. Sorry for going so far. Which we're not going to use. Um, oh, one thing I did want to say, just with the Space Association news, um, for people that are, might recall, we did a survey um, of members on projects going forward. We didn't actually receive any submissions. We, we published an RFP request for, for a proposal. We didn't, uh, we didn't receive anything. However, we do know that there is a proposal that is in work at the moment. Um, so the, the surveys or the, 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 the invitation is still out there. Uh, hopefully by the next meeting, we'll have details on the proposal and it'll be run through the committee and we can give you some more details on that. It looks quite exciting and very promising. And uh, hopefully I think people will think it's a good thing to do. Um, so, okay, I'm just gonna whiz through here again. Um, I'm not, I'm not gonna hold down this nonsense. Okay, I might um, Sorry, let me just get to it. Next meeting is October 24. Um, just a, I'll whiz, really quick, quick whiz through the space news, Australian space news. There's been another piece of the uh, st uh, SpaceX um, trunk being recovered in, in the New South Wales back, and that's res resulted in a, um, a report uh, to the UN General Assembly's Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space from Australia. So just reporting what it was, what was there and and the details about it. So um, SpaceX did come out and have a look at it and uh, we're waiting on the results. Uh, Toowoomba Airport is to become a, a Virgin Orbit uh, launching place where they'll, people might recall Virgin Orbit, they launch rockets from the bottom, they drop it from the bottom of the 747. So they're going to, they've announced plans to, to base out of Well Camp in Toowoomba, which is a bit inland of Brisbane, but anyway. That's a location. So they'll take off, fly out over the Pacific and launch their rockets from there. So that'll be quite exciting. This is the, the architecture of the Virgin Orbit um, uh, system. So Anastasia Palaszczuk is on all that. Uh, Global Space News, once again. Uh, Capstone, I don't know what anyone's mentioned, the Capstone probe, which was Launched on a SpaceX uh, on a um, uh, a Rocket Lab rocket, uh, which uh, was going out to the moon. The actual cap that's done, done its uh, third, I believe, third course correction. It's a very slow trajectory out to the moon because it's using very low power, but it's now tumbling. Uh, so uh, they're trying to get hold of it. They've managed to make contact with it, um, but the um, the solar panels are not getting a lot of sunlight, a lot, lot of power. So they're, they're working together to try and get it back under control. So whether or not it does actually make, make a full recovery and continue the mission, we're not sure. So the, the, 
the concept of gate of capstone is to establish or test out this orbit that the eventual lunar gateway is going to uh, take around the moon. So it was quite a critical test of that architecture. So hopefully they will be able to get it detumbled, detumbled and stabilized. So this is a graphic of the of the orbit that it goes out, eventually gets out to lunar distance and then goes into this um, retrograde orbit with the moon. Um, as uh, Angelo mentioned, Axiom has been uh, tabbed, tapped to provide moonwalking spacesuits. This is a concept, oh no, it's not. Oh, this is the one, okay. No, uh, these are the mock-up of the spacesuits that they're gonna be building for Artemis moon missions. Um, so hopefully that gets them moving along a fair bit. Um, the base value is only $228 million. So it's not, they haven't actually procured any suits yet. It's just to get them continuing to move. Um, big partnership involved there. And they've also, NASA's also request for a second Artemis crew lander. So obviously they've chosen to go with SpaceX. They announced that back in 2021 for the first lander, but now, this must be a, a, a government operation. They're going out again for sustainable moon landers. So who knows what they're going to end up with. So as Angelo mentioned, I think um, Blue Origin and um, the National Team are putting back uh, proposals of revised of their proposal that they had back in 2021. So who knows what we're going to end up with. But it uh, seems a crazy way to procure <coughs> a landing system, but anyway. This is the NASA we've got. Um, so yeah, this is a, a mock-up I did of, uh, of the uh, Starship landing at the same angle that uh, Apollo uh, 15 landed, which is 11 degrees off center, so interesting. A new Shepard, I don't know whether it's been mentioned, suffered an in-flight abort, it was unmanned, uh, or no crew. So the abort system worked flawlessly, uh, so that's a great thing, but obviously the fact that it failed is a problem. So FAA is investigating that as per normal, and um, they will try to work out what's going to go on there. Um, as Angelo might have mentioned, um, Artemis back and forth to the launch pad. Um, who knows what's going to happen? So um, as Angela, I think mentioned there, they're assessing overnight, basically tonight, what they're gonna do um, as far as the opportunity to launch versus the risk of hurricane versus rolling back and the time it takes, et cetera, et cetera. I think if they, if they can hold off at the pad um, and they're comfortable, they could possibly launch on the 2nd of October, but. It's pretty sketchy and pretty optimistic to be able to do that. Um, so yeah, I think tonight, overnight, we might hear more about what's happening. I suspect they're gonna go back into the VAB. Um, I thought you might be interested, just quickly, this is a video of um, That was a video of, uh, of the quick disconnect, but it's not running, so it's okay. So this storm, uh, Ian, I think it's called, has got a track. It's predicting that it could impact Florida. Might go further into the Gulf, who knows? But um, they're just gonna see what, what happens over the next few days. This is from last Friday. This was in red is the Melbourne Times of where they think it might have been at this, that particular time. Um, so whether or not it uh, does, in fact, um, give them an opportunity, I'm not sure. So once again, Monday, October 3rd, 5.52 a.m. Melbourne time, if they don't roll off, if they want to go ahead, if the storm doesn't impact them. Once again, fairly unlikely, I suspect. Uh, they've also got a SpaceX launch for Crew 5 uh, happening on the 4th of October at uh, 3.45 a.m. Melbourne time on Tuesday. Um, one of the things that was a, a consideration that they had is the um, flight termination system on Artemis, and they did finally get from the Space Force 
an extension to that. Um, so once again, another risk, another reward, who knows whether that's viable and whether it's um, worthwhile doing. Uh, for those people who have been shown this, this uh, graphic for the last few months, these are the launch windows. We're now looking at the October top right-hand corner. Um, obviously there's other launch windows further down through the uh, matrix there. The green is, uh, they can achieve the um, objectives. The red, they can't. The gray is not an opportunity. So we'll see what happens. And that's the, um, that's the uh, flight plan for Artemis One. Uh, all right, well, I was going to introduce Melbourne Space Program, but they've already done. Thank you, gentlemen. That was for everyone who was there. Um, and that's it for me. Go from there. Hi, I'm going to uh, talk about the DART mission, which is going to impact tomorrow morning at uh, 9.14 Australian Eastern Standard Time. The NASA TV broadcast will start at 8 a.m. Now, part of the background to this, uh, this uh, picture here shows the... Uh, that one. Okay, good. Uh, this shows where impacts have happened since 1988 to uh, 2022. And the biggest impact has been the Shalabinsk impact. Here are the asteroids and the hazards that they would uh, give us and the estimated frequency of those sorts of impacts. Now, what's going to happen is that DART will come in and hit Diamorphos, which is a 160 meter diameter um, asteroid, at about 11 kilometers per, uh, sorry, at about 6.6 .6 kilometers per second, which is about 24,000 kilometers per hour. At the moment, the asteroid is 11 kilometers from the Earth, which means the light time travel, uh, radio signal travel is 36 seconds. Now, as it's approaching, it's going to be taking pictures and uh, these will be uh, onboard processed. Um, it takes five seconds. Then, um, and there's one picture per second going to be taken. So, five seconds onboard processing then there's the 36 second transit time and once the pictures are right back on earth there's another five seconds to process it so that means that we'll see the pictures one uh so 46 seconds after the actual event now the idea is that um it will hit this head head on on this dark graphic, the diamorphous is going around in that direction there. In other words, going clockwise, as seen here. And here is a picture which is supposed to be moving. <clears throat> Doesn't seem to be moving. Okay. Uh, well, we'll skip that. It actually shows um, uh, Didymos moving across the field of view, taken from a ground-based observatory. So here we go with the impact. And um, in this case here, they're going around. The idea is it's going to slow it down by about, they estimate somewhere up to 10 minutes difference in period. So it'll go into a, a slow it down, go, drop it into the new orbit, which is the blue circle. And that will be of a shorter duration. And so the period will be decreased by up to 10 minutes. I'm not sure just how much. Okay, how big are these asteroids? Well, Didymos is 780 meters and Diamorphos is 163 meters. And that compares to say like Diamorphos is like hitting the, grand, the Great Pyramid of Giza. About the same mass and about the same size. So wham. Uh, by the way, DART itself is 19 meters across, although the main body is a lot smaller. Let's move on. There's only one real instrument on board and that's the uh, Draco camera shown here with the arrow. And it's uh, basically a high powered telescope. Now what's gonna happen when it hits there, if there's no ejector, 
then there'll be just a small change in velocity of the asteroid. On the other hand, if there's a moderate amount of ejector, then the ship will be much larger. And of course, if there's a lot of ejector, then there'll be a large change in the um, velocity of the asteroid. And that'd be even more measurable. Okay. Where is it being tracked from? Uh, they will not, we'll, we'll have to track it for several months in order to work out whether or not the orbit has been changed. And one of the stations is at Siding Spring. It's the, um, the LG, LCOGT uh, telescope. It's part of a network of them around the world and that's in Siding Spring. So Siding Spring is uh, involved, as is Mount John in the South Island of New Zealand. Now, this is a picture taken by the Laker Cube satellite uh, of the Earth. So this is a picture looking back at the Earth. Now, remember the Earth is about 11 million kilometers away. So it's got a pretty powerful telescope aboard the CubeSat. And there's the Pleiades, again, taken by the Italian satellite. Meanwhile, DART itself has been training its telescope on Jupiter. And one of the problems is going to be, can they distinguish between the main asteroid, Didymos, and the smaller, much fainter, Diamorphus. Remember, it's going around. So they've practiced with looking at uh, Europa, for example, coming out from eclipse of Jupiter to see if it works. And uh, they're quite happy that it's, it's going to work. Now, this again, ah, it doesn't play. 